Great to have you today, Church on the Rock. If you don't know who I am, um, same as my name badge. I'm Pastor Joe, associate pastor here. And um, Pastor Josh has asked me to uh, share this morning on the topic of evangelism. We've been covering the book of Jonah. I'm going to refer to the book of Jonah, but Pastor Josh is going to continue that series, and we're going to make reference to that too. So um, I'm glad that, that God had Nineveh, Nineveh in his sights. You know, God sent Jonah to Nineveh to reach the spiritually lost. What I mean by that is those that do not know Jesus or have not heard the gospel or made a commitment to him. It's the story of a prophet who was sent on a missions trip to the wicked city at Nineveh to proclaim a message of repentance to them, to give them so that they can make out of their own free will a choice to repent and to turn to God and to turn away from their sin. God sent Jonah because he greatly cared for this wicked city. And so this morning's message is a continuation on the theme of our call to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to the spiritually lost in our world today. It is a mission. It is our mission. It is the great co-mission of the church to share our faith with Jesus. And as we look at our opening passages in just a moment, along with other supporting scriptures, I want us to challenge and encourage you to share your faith of why you're a follower of Jesus with someone who doesn't know Christ as their Lord and Savior, to those who do not yet believe in him, to those who will perish if they do not receive this message and make a decision of their own. So in the next few moments, I want to give you reasons why you should share your faith. Would you all stand and open your Bibles, if you've got your Bibles, electronic or paper, and uh, let's turn to Matthew chapter 28 and Romans chapter 10. Matthew chapter 28 and Romans 10, <clears throat> and let's read from verse 18 of Matthew 28. We'll begin there. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. He says this to all followers of Jesus, to his disciples. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That is the church age. Now, to Romans chapter 10, verse 14 and 15, it says, How then can they, that is, those who don't know Christ or the message of Christ, the spiritually lost, how can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one, in God, in Jesus, of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching or sharing their faith with them? And how can they preach unless they are sent as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Well, the title of this morning's message is Sharing Your Faith, Beautiful Feet. Followers of Jesus, I want you to turn to your neighbor right now and tell them you have beautiful feet. And then you may be seated. You have beautiful feet. Okay. Okay. Amen, amen. <laughs> Make sure you write that down in your footnotes, okay? All right. Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word to our hearts today. Thank you that your word is alive, it's eternal. You're speaking to us, right to our hearts this morning. Thank you that you're the God who speaks. Holy Spirit, speak to where we're living right now in our relationship with you. God, it's your heart. God, to, for us as the church, to tell the good news to other people and to share our faith. Speak to us, Lord Jesus. God, draw us into your thoughts today that we might respond by your grace in obedience to you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. Hey, did you know that your feet are beautiful in the eyes of God? Wherever you go and whenever you go to someone and share with them the good news of Jesus Christ, our Savior. How many of you think... The United States needs good news. How many think the world needs good news? Boy, Jesus is good news. I'm so glad that 
for the obedient feet of a young man, 18 years old, his name was Mark, and another young man named, named Jack, who came into my life in August of 1972. They brought witness to me about the good news of Jesus, and their witness to me has changed the entire trajectory of my life. I'm not ashamed to tell you today, I'm excited to tell you today, that I am glad that I'm a follower of Jesus. I don't want to ever turn back. I don't want to go back to the life where I was because I know the pit where I came from. I know what the Lord has done for me. I don't know, folks, how I could put it together today without knowing Jesus, with all that's going on, all the things in this life. I'm just glad, just, just flat out glad to know Jesus, and I'm thankful that he's my Savior. Amen. Get this, folks. Twice in one week, in separate places, God sent two people, separate places, not orchestrated, and they shared their faith with me in a time when my life was bottoming out. My parents were close to divorce, and they were not a happy couple. My al alcohol in my family had brought a lot of pain in the home life where I grew up. I loved my parents. I wouldn't trade them for anyone. I loved my family. But it seemed like everything was falling apart, and my opinion of myself as a person was very low. I was very shy and beaten down in confidence in myself. I believed in Jesus Christ. My parents dropped me off for church. My dad occasionally would, would attend. My mom would go more often. But folks, I'm glad for that background, but I didn't know Jesus. I had no relationship with him. It's possible to go to church and not have a relationship with him. It just didn't click. It just didn't click. And to put it concisely, my life was empty and void. A man named Mark came into my life first. He came to our rock group practice, and we were playing at uh, the, organ, the organ player's home, and we had finished rock group practice, and this young man, Mark, had gone to, to he was in my class in high school, he'd gone to a, a Bible camp in Minnesota, he accepted Jesus. He comes right from that place, he comes right to our rock group practice, we're all there sit, sitting uh, popcorn afterwards, and he begins sharing in his faith in Jesus Christ with five other teenagers right there. And he's brand new. He knew very little, but he's sharing what he knew. And not only this, he gave an altar call. That is, he gave an invitation. He said, how many of you want to receive Christ like I did? And you know, the Holy Spirit was just speaking to me. and just like, yeah, I bet. but you know what? I was thinking this. I was thinking, you know, my pastor has to pray for this. Otherwise, it doesn't really count. That's the way I thought. That's the way I thought. The Holy Spirit would just zap me. I wanted to receive the Christ, but I didn't. A few days later, there's, there's, came Jack's feet. And I'm going to this church because I want to check out this, this drummer playing at this church. His name was Benny Beeman. And I, I, I heard he was good at the drums, and I just wanted to see what, what he was doing. And so we walk into this empty church, and the platform's lit up, and they're playing this, they call this Jesus music. And it was pretty radical back then because, you know, to have any drums in church back then was, was a radical thing. And so I'm listening to that, and... Um, and with a couple of friends, I had about two friends, that's all I had, and um, my two friends were with me, and Jack walked up to us, sat in the pew behind us, and it's dark where we're sitting there, and we were listening to the music. And, and so, I guess, and guess what? The Holy Spirit was speaking through Jack the same words that Mark had been saying Lord, uh, earlier that week. So this second witness of Christ to me through Jack led me Jack would led me in a prayer to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. He saw that I was shy, I was introverted. We went next door into this thing called a Jesus Coffee House. And we, there I knelt between my, my two best friends, and, and, and um, I've never been the same ever since. Thank God. I'm thankful I'm a follower of Jesus. How beautiful are the feet of them that bring good news. One sowed, Mark sowed, another reaped, and I accepted the Lord. I want to get into some reasons why you should be sharing your faith with others. Okay, the first reason is this. Number one, you should share your faith because you are fully authorized by Jesus. You are fully authorized by Jesus. Notice again in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20, 
where Jesus' last command before he ascended into heaven was to commission his followers, his disciples then, and it's the same for us today, to reach the nations with the good news of Jesus Christ. Look at it again in verse 18. It says, Then Jesus said unto them, All authority, how much authority? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, Jesus said. Then he says to his disciples, Father Jesus, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you, church, always to the very end of the the age, the church age. Wow, what a challenge, what a challenge. Every follower, every follower of Jesus Christ, every individual who identifies with Christ and the church as a whole collectively is called to bring the good news of the message of Christ to others. Jesus' last command is to be our first priority. Sharing Christ with others is obedience to that command. Jesus said to Peter, John, and all of his soon-to-be disciples, he said this in Matthew chapter 14, verse 9. He said, come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. These were fishermen. He said, you can catch fish. He caught a lot of fish. He said, I'm going to teach you now how to fish for men. Followers of Jesus, you are completely, totally authorized commission to fish for the souls of men and women who desperately need Jesus. They need them, even if they don't know it, even if they're not asking it, go and tell them. It is God's will. Did you know that the Word of God, the Bible, is God's will for you? It's God's will for you to share your faith with non-believing people. God has delegated this wonderful task to the followers of Jesus. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, what he says is true for all of us who identify with Christ as Christ's followers. He says this, we are Christ's ambassadors, his representatives. We are his ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us, the church. The reason God sent Jonah to Nineveh was to bring the message of repentance And that's because he chooses to work through in his followers to make his appeal. Jesus wants you to make an appeal for him, to give a testimony to them. You can share your testimony with someone. Do you know that people cannot deny your testimony? You can say, you say, I've been changed. You know, God's changed my life. And that they can't say, no, he hasn't when he has. You have a powerful, unique story that is your testimony. You can share what God has done for you. The blind man said this, all I know is I was blind, but now I see. You have something to share. All of us do if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord. So the reason God sent Jonah to Nineveh was to bring a message of repentance is because he chooses to work through his followers to make his appeal. How are the Ninevites going to hear God's word, his message of repentance, unless Jonah went to them? He didn't say, well, he didn't go obey the first time, so I'll just have to go myself. No, he said he wanted Jonah to go there. How is your neighbor? How are your loved ones? How are your work associates? How are the people that you rub shoulders with all each week going to hear unless someone who knows Jesus and who knows the message goes to them? Already we've read from Romans chapter 10, verse 14 and 15, how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? You know, we live in America. We assume, you know, we see all these steeples, crosses, all these things. We assume that people have heard the message of Jesus. Folks, there's a lot of folks that have never, ever heard. They have no clue. They have no clue. I've had neighbors that had no clue what the resurrection is. I'll testify people at work and say, what's the meaning of Easter? You know what makes Easter the the unique message of all the religions of the world? And it's my way to witness them. One of the ways, I use holidays, events, anything, and I say it's the resurrection. It's the resurrection. And and you just just segue into that, and God can use it. See, they're not going to hear unless you say something. Don't assume 
they've heard it because they live in America. You might be the first one to sow the good news into their life, and you may be also the one to reap it. Maybe one will sow, maybe another will reap. God's word has a guarantee that it will never go out void. It will accomplish it. People are never the same when they hear the truth. You bring the truth to them, they got to deal with it. God's going to work on their heart because he loves them. How beautiful are those, are the feet of those who bring good news. Tell your neighbor, you got beautiful feet. Amen. Reason number two, why should you share your, your faith? It is God's heart. It is God's heart. His last command was Jesus' number one desire. Before he went to heaven, he said this, Let your beautiful feet go where Jesus' feet went. went. He went to seek and to save that which was lost. This is what he said in Luke chapter 19 uh, when he went to the culturally despised tax collector named Zacchaeus. He said, The Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. Like the typical tax collector in the Roman days, he collected more taxes. Zacchaeus collected more taxes than he should, and he put the rest in his pocket. He was despised. He was despised. You know, see, God values people. He values people. Mankind has been made in the image of God. Jesus' last command reveals again his greatest desire, that is, the salvation of the spiritually lost. God loves all people. And here's the truth, folks. There's only one human race. We may have different skin tones, but all of our blood bleeds the same. It bleeds red. We have one creator, and our creator loves the soul of every person the same. Jesus paid the same price for everyone and holds that same gift out to them, and he's never been willing for one person that he's created to go to hell. How about you? Do you love all people? A lot of us don't. A lot of us struggle with people that are different with us than us. I don't love all people perfectly like God does all the time. There's times I struggle. I need God's supernatural touch to to reach out to someone who's hurt me. I have to forgive them, but I get to get, forgive them. And when I forgive someone, I'm free from, that, from that, that, uh, that unforgiveness. And God lets me out of jail because he's forgiven me of things I don't deserve. I can forgive others. And I can have a heart. You know, I don't love all people as I should, but I can tell you this. I love more people now because of Jesus Christ than I've ever loved before. And God's helping me to change what hasn't been changed so far. And God will do the same thing for you too. I need the Lord's help to love all people, but that is my heart to do that. God wants to give you his heart. He wants to give you his desire so that all people will hear the good news from your mouth and from my mouth. God wants to help you love people that are different from you so that you will love their soul enough to share your faith with them. Look at Jonah. He struggled with certain people. He didn't have God's heart. That's why he ran away from God's call to preach to them. He had a prejudice against them. And he would not share God's message with them. In his heart, he figured he felt they didn't deserve it. Why? They were a brutal, violent people. They were oppressive to the nation of Israel. At the time of Jonah, they were a wealthy world empire. They had the world's largest army in the ancient world. They would torture their victims. Prisoners of war would be tortured to death for their sheer pleasure. They were very hard in character and a very proud people. May we never get to the point where we would wish that someone would spend an eternity without Christ. May our hearts never get to that point. God says to love even our enemies, even those who who mistreat us. Pray for them. He says do good to them. He says to do that. You know, God will help us to supernaturally love all kinds of people. And God will help us. When we went to South Sudan, East Africa, Linda and I to do missions work, they had just gone through 20 years of civil war. And the Arab Muslims from the north bombed the black people in the south where we were at 
three times a day. That's what the Sudanese told us. With Russian bombers, they would come and they would be bombed. People died. The average age when we were there, we were told between 18 and 19 people, not many Sudanese with gray hair, were there. We met a man named Pastor Christopher who was tortured. He was tortured by the Arabs to renounce his faith and put his faith in Islam. He was tortured. They hung him by, by meat hooks on, with, on the armpit to, to get him to renounce his faith in Christ. And he never did. He never did. And he, and he lived to tell about it. Others were tortured. Sudanese were chained to, to hot cement uh, concrete. People were treated like dirt. You know, one of the challenges of our ministry to them, having gone through them, was to encourage them to love their enemies to the north, to love their souls, and to share Jesus with them. How many think that would be kind of difficult when you had something like that happen to you? You know, it's, fo it, 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 it's true. We all need God's supernatural help to love people Lord, that, that are different from us, people that have hurt us. And um, who is your Ninevite? Who is the person that you would, that would hesitate to share the good news? You know, we have the gift. We can hold out the gift through the message of Jesus Christ to others. The Sudanese people, they needed healing. And God desire in order... Uh, uh, and desire is to care for them and care for their souls. Let me just say this again. We know we are more like Jesus when we care and share our faith, even with those who have hurt us or are different from us because we love their souls enough to do so. Amen. Jesus said this in John chapter 4 and verse 34. He said, my food is to do the will of him, that is the heavenly father who sent me, and finish his work. Do not say, speaking of the harvest field of souls, the spiritual loss, do not say four months more and then the harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. See the exclamation point there. Open your eyes, church, and look at the fields. They are ripe for the harvest. I have a garden, and anyone who's a farmer knows this. When the crops are ready, you got so much time to do this. So it's a, it's a, it's a signal of urgency because one day this person may be on, on this side of heaven or eternity, and the next day they could be gone. We have no guarantee but to, of what that we have today. That's all we have. You know, I know this is an understatement, but our nation needs Jesus. Our nation needs good news. I believe that people are seeing all kinds of crazy things happening in our government, our schools, on our borders. There's confusion in our culture today about so many different things. Once what was considered good is now being redefined as bad. And once things that were once considered bad are now being considered good. And so people are seeing, they're witnessing crime, chaos, in, in, in our cities and universities, it seems like everything is being shaken around us because you know why? Everything is being shaken around us. Everything is being shaken. People are wondering in the midst of all this, what is true? What is going on? Is there still hope in life? And you know, people are searching. The harvest is ripe. The soil of people's hearts are right. And they have ears that are open to someone that will bring good news to them. They will think about your witness. People are coming to faith in Christ, and they are surrendering their lives to him. I don't know if you've heard this already, but thousands of students on secular university campuses in the United States have had gatherings in recent months this year to pray, to repent of their sin, and they are giving their hearts completely to Jesus. How many have heard reports? Lift your hands. You've heard of these reports. Okay, some of you have. On secular campuses, and the, there are reports of students being water baptized in university fountains, in pickup trucks filled with water, and in horse troughs. And then, this is reportedly happening in Auburn University, at Florida University. Florida University, I, it's rumored, is the second most partying university in, in the United States. And it's also happening in, at the University of Tennessee and in Alabama. Alabama. There's a lady named Tr uh, Tanya Pruitt, and she's the founder of Unite Us. Unite Us. And she said this. 
She's been in these universities and and ministering to these students. She says, we have thousands of students showing up at these events, and hundreds are giving their lives to Jesus Christ. Hundreds are being water baptized. We are hearing testimony, she said, from these students saying, hey, I was contemplating suicide, but I left with the most joy and peace I've ever experienced. It's just amazing and moving, and moving, she says. In, the May, in May of this year, last month, the largest water baptism uh, uh, ever held in America was held in Huntington, California, where 12,000 people were immersed. The harvest, folks, is ripe. The harvest is ripe. The labors are few. People are being converted to Christ with great joy, with great joy. That brings me to the next reason. Another reason to share our faith is you and others is because you and others will receive a fresh infusion of joy. How many could use a fresh infusion of joy? You know, uh, salvation and joy always accompany each other. I remember the initial joy when I knelt between my two friends. Tears were coming down. It was emotional. It was emotional. I, I had tears of gratefulness and, and thanksgiving when I finally realized what Jesus had done for me on the cross. You know, I found that one of the greatest infusions of joy uh, is when I realized that I've had a big part or even the smallest part being used as an instrument of God's, God's voice in bringing someone else to G, into faith in Jesus Christ. You know, Satan would try to rob me of, of joy, but I'm thank you that no circumstance, that nothing in life will, or anything that can happen can, can separate me from the joy of my salvation that Jesus Christ has given me. Amen. Praise God for that. In John chapter 4, in verse 36, Jesus says this, Even now the reaper draws his wages. Even now he, he harvests the crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad, filled with joy together. Y'all, the angels rejoice when people come to faith in Christ. And there is joy when you see people come to Christ and the Lord uses and works through you. All laborers will share in the joy of the harvest together. That's what God's word says. In Acts chapter 8, verse 4, 5, and 8, Philip and the people of Samaria realize this joy. Let's look at these verses here. Those, who are those? These are the people that, that have been persecuted after Stephen the martyr died for his faith. And they all were forced to leave their homes in Jerusalem. And they were scattered beyond. And it says, look at this. They, these people, these people have been scattered, preached the word wherever they went. Wow, that's the church. That's the church. You take it wherever you go. Philip went down to a city of Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. And so there was what? Great joy in that city. Salvation brings great joy to the laborer and the convert. How many want to see great joy in your neighborhood? How many want to see great joy in your neighbor's household? In the the city of Huntley, in Hampshire, over in Pingree Grove, in in, uh, uh, Bartlett, Streamwood, and all these. God wants to bring joy to this nation, and he wants to do it through your witness. He wants to work, speak to you and through you. You know, in all of our years of ministry, Lynn and I have received great joy whenever we've seen and had any kind of part to see people come into faith in Christ. So let me just boast in the Lord because it's a spiritual work. We just are the instruments, and God will use you as an instrument. But may, let me boast. We have seen this. We've been in ministry since 1980, and we're old enough to see things over a length of time. And uh, we've seen couples saved. We've seen their children saved and marry Christians And we've seen their grandchildren saved. We've seen our neighbors come to Christ. 
and go to church and be literally changed, and they're still serving the Lord. Whole households filled with joy with the newfound faith in Jesus. We've seen lives changed to the glory of God in all of our places of ministry, whether in Crystal Lake, in Joliet, in Marengo, in Lake in the Hills, in South Sudan, East Africa, and even now, followers of Jesus, if you will share your faith, you will know a fresh infusion of joy. How many want joy? Yes. How beautiful are the feet that bring good news? Say to your neighbor, you have beautiful feet, okay? All right, another reason to share your faith is this. You will be exercising your faith. You'll be exercising your faith. Nothing pleases God more than believing and doing. <laughs> That's what disciples are supposed to do. It's inseparable. Belief comes to an action. They're coupled together. Sharing faith is a love action. That's what it is. Hebrews eleven six says this, and without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. This is true in every area of obedience, including sharing our faith. Every time you share your faith, you are obeying the Lord. His last command, his first desire, our first priority as a church, you, when you proclaim the good news to this generation, when your beautiful feet go somewhere who, to someone who does not know Christ and you initiate a conversation about Jesus, you are stepping through a threshold of faith. You know what? You're going out to the edge. You're going out to the edge. It's like, okay, God, here I go. And it's a place of dependency. It's a good place. Folks, the place of faith is a good place to be. Say amen to that. We got to exercise our faith. You've heard me say this. Faith needs exercising. If you work out your faith, everything will work out. Okay? All right. Faith is like a muscle. If it's not used, atrophy will set in. Okay? It'll sag like this. All right? All right? That's the skinny on on that analogy, all right? Exercise your faith. I mean this all in my heart. Will toughen your faith. You'll only grow in faith as you exercise it. And same with me. You know, you will exp as you share your faith, you will experience successes and you'll experience rejections. Are you okay with that? You know, Jesus said, no, no one is, no, uh, no servant is greater than his master. If they did that to me, they'll do that to you. You know, Jesus was rejected. That's why they put him on the cross. He said, even then, he, he loved them. And he said, Father, forgive them for them. they know not what they do. You know, the successes will encourage you. God will never override a person's free will. Jesus had to deal with people with free wills. We don't force conversions upon people. The true faith of Christianity in Jesus followers we don't force people. It's impossible to have a genuine relationship. Forcing a relationship, it just doesn't work. See, success is encourage you when people accept Christ. Rejection, rejections will toughen you if you don't give up. Very early in ministry, I realized that I needed to be in the community if I was going to reach new people for Jesus Christ. While I ministered in Crystal Lake as a youth pastor, associate pastor, intern pastor, all these things, I built relationship with area high schools. And I had an open door um, with some teachers that I met. I was able to go in and share about Christian values in the classroom. This is back in the 1980s, all right? And uh, so I had relationship with these teachers. I went into the cafeteria, sat with our students in there, and I just uh, went in. I was just rubbing shoulders with, with, with young people. I introduced myself to principals, superintendents, and eventually the Lord helped me to organize a Malte High School outreach. And I joined, we joined another church in McHenry doing this too. And we had a Christian speaker. We invited a Christian speaker to come and do an all-school drug assembly. How many ever were in drug assemblies when you were in high school? Raise your hand. All right. Back then, they, they used to say this. They would say that CHG is in marijuana and you're not supposed to take that and all that. That's what they used to say. All right. And so we had this Christian uh, uh, speaker come 
and we invited students to come at, in the evening after these rallies were to McHenry County College, and they, we rented this venue, and we invited the students to come, and this druggist speaker would share more about drugs and how it's bad for you, and he would be sharing his faith in Jesus Christ. And so the daytime school rallies went great. In the meantime, I invited the Gideons, the Gideons are people that hand out Bibles, and um, free. I invited them to come and give the student version to the students that were coming in. If they wanted to receive a, a, a free Bible, if they wanted one, they would, they would give them one. And so they were there. A Christian band was there and uh, began the rally and played all this Jesus music. And then I invited a reporter who was my neighbor and considered my friend to come to these daytime assemblies and come to the evening rallies to come and see this. Well, the evening rally, the daytime rallies went great. The evening rally went awesome. We had 600 students come out, right? Tarrion County, raise your hands. They were my youth sponsors. They were there. They'll verify what I'm saying is, is true. And that, at the end of the rally, we had about 100 students, right? Come forward to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Praise God for that. We had it all on tape. We videotaped it there and all this. And, um, and I was elated. And I was on a spiritual high, but then came the persecution. My neighbor reporter friend, uh, whom I invited but never attended the evening rallies or these, or these uh, daytime rallies, he wrote an article in a newspaper entitled, Hundreds of Kids Tricked into Coming uh, into re Attending Religious Rally. He said in the in article, students were forced to accept Bibles. Students were being lynched in the hallways. And, and that we use cult-like techniques during the invitation. He had, had been done a series in his newspaper of cults and that, and so he included us in this series. And the reporting was not accurate at all. What was the result of that? I was banned from one of the campuses there. I couldn't go there anymore. The success of this outreach now suddenly appeared to be a failure. But was it? But was it? My faith was shaken uh, uh, it's temporarily. Linda walked into work and she heard hundreds of kids read it in the so-and-so newspaper into really blah, 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 and that and so you just want to kind of crawl into a hole in that. And you know, so I invited the reporter to come and to watch the tape and all these things and I could show him what the truth was about all these things. And um, you know, Satan wanted me to focus to, to focus only on the negative and not on the victories. He wanted me to feel as if I should have never told anyone about Jesus. And folks, that's exactly where the enemy wants to keep you, in a place where, oh, you are a fool for sharing Jesus with someone else. Did you know this, that people out there are sharing their faith every day, and they are not ashamed of one word that they say. They'll curse your God. They'll trample the name of Jesus. They teach their false ideologies and their narratives, and they are not ashamed. We should not be ashamed. Amen? Amen. We need some spine. We need some spine in the, in, the, in the kingdom of God. You know, the enemy, I've learned this in ministry, whatever you do right, the, the enemy will come to you in some form and say you did wrong. And condemn you. You say, you fool. Yeah, let's be fools for Jesus then. Let's be fools for Jesus. You know, I wrote a, an opinion in the newspaper about the truth. I, I wrote a rebuttal, that is, and it was written and published as an opinion. I knew what the power of the press was, but I also know the power of my Jesus too. He's greater. Lives were changed. And I learned that some things I could do different the next time. And the Lord gave me wisdom. And guess what, folks? There was the next time. I brought a high school speaker in the next year. And then we went to Joliet and we did it again. And again. And again. And again. And we saw students touched by the power of Jesus on these, on the, on these high school campuses. And the Lord blessed that time. Praise God. My faith was toughened. And I continued in high school campus ministry, and the door continued to be open, and to God be glory. We need to advance and not retreat. Don't let the enemy lie to you. Folks, sharing your faith with others is good for you spiritually. It will toughen your faith. You have beautiful feet. You have beautiful feet. 
followers of Jesus, go where the fish are. Go where Jesus' feet would go. Do not give in to the spirit of fear. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2 says this, For God did not give us, the church, followers of Jesus, a spirit of timidity or fear, but a power of love and self-discipline. There's times when I didn't want to go into the fray, but I said, Lord, I'm going to do it. I'm going to go where your feet went. My feet are going to go where your feet would be. I'm going to go there. I'm going to do that. Folks, your feet belong where the spiritually lost are. Don't let anything or anyone hinder you from your call. You are completely authorized, and Jesus is with you always in this great endeavor. Sharing your faith, it's a spiritual adventure. May it be said, let me testify that there's nothing boring in following Jesus. It's an adventure. It's an adventure. If you're bored out of your socks, well, I challenge you, share your faith. Share your faith. Well, time necessitates me to give the remaining reasons in rapid progression. So here we go. Number five, we should share our faith. Another reason is that you will be personally, you will personally see the miraculous. What is the greatest miracle of all? A changed life. A changed life. I, it's miraculous. The Lord has done in my life. You could say the same. Paul says this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, he writes, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. You know, a life changed by the power of Jesus Christ, think about it, is the greatest miracle of all. In the Bible, in the scriptures, as Jesus' followers, he promised this to us when we come to Christ, a new life, an abundant life, a faithless life, an eternal life. He promised us a new heart, a glad heart, a clean heart. He promised us a new mind, a renewed mind, one not conformed to the patterns of this world, the mind of Christ. He promised us a new name. Christian, we are a follower. Our our identity is in Christ. He will give us a new name written down in glory. When we see him face to face, he'll give you his a name that is especially for you, that is between you and him. He will give us a new covenant when we come to Christ, a binding agreement between God and man of a relationship with him that will never change, never change, made possible through the blood of Jesus. When we come to Christ, he gives us a new spirit. He gives us the Holy Spirit dwelling in every believer and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When we come to Christ, we have a new song, a song of praise and thanksgiving in our hearts. We can sing. Of what all Jesus has done, he puts a new law. He gives us a new law to live by, the law of love. And he gives us a new labor, the great commission of sharing our faith with with Christ with others. And yes, miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. Yes, you could lay your hands on the sick in the public. And guess what? Jesus just might heal them there and save them right there. God can do that. You have to believe that. We have to believe that. We are sent to do this. Amen? Amen. We are. We are. Believe it. As you witness, God can do the miraculous to confirm the message. Another reason to share your faith is you will personally be thinking outwardly. That's a good thing. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. Go into all the world, church, and preach the good news to all creation. Your beautiful feet will take you outside of your own world and into the lives of others. This is a very unselfish thing. It will take time from your schedule, yes. It will take attention off of you and your problems. And you'll bring attention to someone else. It causes us to focus on the needs of people in our community and in our communities. Folks, nothing sharing about Jesus, nothing about this with others is about us. It's about him. It's not about our reputation. It's not about anything about, it's all about others. Another reason to share your faith is this. It will be good for the church. Why? Because it keeps the main thing, the main thing. It's the mission of the church to reach people for Jesus. Linda and I, we spent 23 23 years planting churches, doing church plants. And when we left Joliet, we went to Marengo to to start a church. It was just us and the wind blowing in the trees. And the one obvious thing that is there is this. We got to reach people. (laughs) There's nobody going here. There's nobody going here. 
And you know what? The, lo the Lord helped us to reach people. We want to reach people. We don't want to reach, like Pastor John said, we don't want to reach transfer growth. We want to reach people that didn't know Jesus. We want them to come and start a new work and to be there and to see God do it. And you know what? In a church plan, it's really obvious you're doing everything until someone else can help share that with you. And then, but this is what we notice. Many churches are graying and dying out and closing because they're not keeping the main thing, the main thing. We're not sent to sit and soak and sour. We are sent to the mission field. When we exit these doors, we go to our mission field. We go there. Keep the main thing, the main thing. Another reason to share your faith is this. You will always hunger for the Spirit's fullness. You will. Because, again, you're on the edge. You're on the edge. You open your mouth. What's going to come out of that person's mouth? What's going to happen? Man, it's exciting. It's really exciting. Okay? Um, and God will use you and speak to you and through you. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus says this, You will receive church power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. You're going to witness what God has done in your life to somebody else. You can witness that a car accident. Oh, this is what I saw. Well, this is what, I, this is what happened when I came to Christ. This is what I was before I knew Christ. This is how I came to Christ, and this is what happened after I've come to Christ. My life has changed. You can have that same, that same life. We can share that. Isn't that wonderful? And you will depend upon the Lord because we can't save anybody. We're just the instrument. The Holy Spirit brings the conviction. The Holy Spirit opens the mind. The Holy Spirit shows people their need of Him. Let me encourage you to step into the spiritual adventure of sharing your faith. Share your testimony again with someone. You have the unique story nobody can deny. Leave a Bible tract with them. God can still use that. Okay? Invite people to church. Invite people and ask their parents to bring their kids to day camp. That's what we want to do. It's us for them, right? Us for them. We want to reach. We want to reach people. Pray for the needs of a waiter or a waitress before you pray for your food. Say, hey, how can I pray? We're going to pray for our food. How can I pray for you? Pray for the sick in public. And you know what? God can do miraculous things. God can do miraculous things. It's Bible, folks. You're anointed for this. You are anointed to do this. You are the priesthood of the believers. It's you and me and us working. Talk to your dental hygienist. Share Christ. I've done this. Talk to your dentist between spitting your teeth out and mouthwash, you know? You know? God will use you. I've gone on test drives. I'm a mechanic. And I've shared faith with all the techs that have come through that shop in 31 years. I've tried to share. Some of them later died in, in their garage. One young man I shared the faith died from carbon monoxide a year or so after I, sh I shared faith. And I would talk to him. And he went on to other things. You never know. You never know. Exercise those beautiful feet. Walk into people's lives like Mark did and Jack did in my life with the good news.